Now, uh, history lessons at school. Frankly, and with the greatest respect to history teachers, a bit boring. Uh, trawling through all your textbooks and you used to learn all the, you know, the kings and queens of England by rote, no, whatever. Uh, the problem was, of course, textbooks were often child-friendly, so they left out all the bits that everyone really wanted to hear about. You know, all the gory bits, the stomach-turning bits, you know, the, the, the bloody, gory, nasty bits that, would, frankly, make up history. Uh, one author hoping to rectify all of that and fill us in on the nasty side of history uh, it is, uh, has written this new book. It's uh, One Bloody Thing After Another, a new book by historian Jacob F. Field, and he's here to tell us more about it. Afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Uh, very well indeed. I had a little flick through it. Um, I was reading about Attila the Hun in your book. Oh, uh, yeah. He, he was a charmer, wasn't he? Really nice guy, uh, as long as he didn't get on his bad side. Um, if he didn't like what Ambassador said to him, you were basically crucified and, and, and left to die. Yeah, so. didn't he used to crucify you, uh, but in such a way that the, the crows would peck you to death? Was that the gist of it f from him, I remember? Yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, we'd leave the crows to finish you off, so you wouldn't quite kill with crucifixion, but, yeah, mm. let you be pecked to death. Nice! Yeah, nice, nice. guy. Uh, and that's the problem, isn't it, with, with history? As we said in your introduction, it's kind of littered with all this stuff, but... It's it's sanitised a bit for the school kids, isn't it? Yeah, history shouldn't just be sort of this endless list of dates and kings and battles. You know, history is about real people who often did really nasty stuff to each other, and uh, hopefully this this book will uh, demonstrate that. And how's the reaction been to it? Because I, I, uh, I would presume, particularly younger readers, are, are loving all this. Yeah, I mean, this isn't a book for very young children. I think it's sort of teenagers and above. But yeah, uh, you know, really good feedback. People are liking it, and. Um, my my mother couldn't believe I'd written such a book. She was shocked I had it in me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, how how were you, how were you with history growing up at school? I mean, you, you're a historian, mm -hmm. so I, I'm guessing you, you must have liked it. But I mean, did you find it all a bit dry when you were being taught it at school? You know what? From from, from time to time, I did. Uh, but luckily, I, I had parents who were very passionate about history, and I was. Uh, you know, read a lot of historical fiction. So that led me to understand that people in the past, you know, you know, there were people as well. So I always like to view them as, you know, people going about their lives uh, rather than just statistics or dates or, you know. And who were the uh, who were the real barbarians? Who were the absolute animals of history? I'm getting with the Romans. They, they've got to be in with a shout, haven't they? They were nasty. I think the Romans are up there as as the most sadistic, um, usually because you know they, they had the games and guide here, so they sort of execute people, you know, not because they're political enemies, but cause just, it's fun. just for fun, really. Yeah, just just for a laugh. And I think the worst was. Um, Probably Emperor Caligula, who used to, you know, throw prisoners to wild beasts and actually use his prisoners as, as feed for his menagerie of wild animals. No. Um, yeah, for, for in the Colosseum. Well, I mean, I've, I've been to the Colosseum in, in, in Rome, and that's a phenomenal thing, is it? When you ever wander around the ruins of that and they, they sort of show you... Because the whole... There's the, the bit, isn't there? There's the bit you see above ground, but there's all the bit underground, which is where all the animals and the prisoners were kept. Yeah, it, animals, is... prisoners. They had special trap doors that would open up so a tiger could, you know, seemingly leap... Um, at, out of floor to surprise her, you know, how it's better. So they really put, put a lot of thought into sort of killing people in the most sadistic and entertaining ways for them. And they, you know, the animals from across the empire, so giraffes, lions, hippos, you know, anything went for them, really. And anything, if it, if it breathed, it could be killed? Yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we're having this chat. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is, this is I, I don't even want to talk about this, Vlad the Impaler and children. Yeah, I mean, Vlad the Impaler is, is the inspiration behind, behind the Dracula myth. And although he didn't actually drink blood, he was a really nasty guy. Dracula basically comes as a nickname, the Dragon, and he was meant to have eaten children. But his, his calling card, his trademark, was impaling people. So this was, you know, a big stake driven to the ground, and then the victim was just driven through the stake and uh, left to die. And so if you're around in 15th century Romania, you, you didn't want to come across Vlad. And I suppose there was no... There was no comeback, was there, any of this? I mean, at the end of the day, it was it was it really was survival of the fittest, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, there was no sort of war crimes tribunal or anything like that to hold these people to account. You know, if, if you could carry on getting away with these activities, um, you would, especially if you were a noble or a king. Well, yeah, and that's the, and that's the thing, isn't it? The, the weird thing to think of, isn't it, is most of, our, most of our monarchy and our nobles and lords are all descended from, from these people through history, aren't they? It is slightly worrying. And also, <laughs> and then sort of how mad some of the European kings went, uh, you know, picking the 18th century, because they were so inbred as well, which didn't help things. Do you think that was the problem, the inbreeding? You know, if you have centuries of marrying your cousin and your aunt and your uncle, <laughs> it does lead to problems, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, we, we, we've talked about the Romans, we've talked about some of these Eastern Europeans. I mean, how, how do us Brits come off with all of this? Were, were, were we a little bit more civilised? Well, I... I... <sighs> No. That's no, isn't it? That's a no. <laughs> you know, we, we had, you know, starting from Queen Boudicca, who, uh, you know, when she felt wronged by the Romans, went and, and, and levelled London, uh, you know, right up to uh, 
executing King Charles the First. You know, you know, Britain features a lot in this book, but you know, but by the nineteenth century, I think as a country, we're becoming less gruesome. I hope, and, yeah. uh, and into the twenty-first too. And Henry the Eighth, he he was a boy, wasn't he? He was uh, he, well, I mean, famously known. That's the, that's that's the one that we probably all do know about, and his uh, his 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 divorce arrangement. Yeah, he was you know on the quest for a son, and then when his first wife didn't do it, uh, you know, Catherine of Aragon, there was the divorce, and that sort of led to the founding of the Church of England. Then when his second wife, Anne Boleyn, you know, did, didn't quite manage the son, she says he was executed under sort of forced pretenses. And, you know, he wasn't afraid to, 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 wield, to wield the axe. And also some of his advisors, if they didn't do the job, would also face uh, the axe. So Didn't he... You, you, you know about all this stuff. Didn't he... Um... He got in someone special to behead Anne, didn't he? So he didn't, he didn't have... It was someone brought in from France, wasn't That's it? That's correct, yeah. Anne didn't want a common axeman. Right. She didn't want the London headsman. She wanted a, someone with a sword because she felt she was a noble and she'd earned this right to be executed with a sword. And it's very difficult to cut off the human head. Is you it? know, if you want to do it in one stroke, you need to get someone good. So they went to France to get a swordsman who'd do it with one stroke. <laughs> and, yeah, so, you know, I don't know what happened to this guy, but I think, you know, he got a good fee for doing a job well. That's, well, that's nice of Henry, isn't it? At least yeah. let Langer have a final wish. Exactly, yeah. And uh, what a job, what a job description. Heads dispatched sufficiently. Yeah. Cool now. <laughs> Lovely. Well, listen, it sounds like a cracking read, and like I said, the, bit, the bits and bobs I've read of it, because it's very... You can dip in and out of your book. It's, uh, it's good. You, I, I did exactly what probably most people did. I had a flick through to try and find the most gruesome bit. Yes, I would not recommend reading it in one sitting, because, you know... You, you, you won't want your dinner afterwards. So, yeah, dip into it. I think that's the best way to do and it. And do me a favour, Jacob. W- w- which is the most gory bit so I can go and find it? I think the most gory bit... I think you should go for Pope Alexander the Sixth. He's it's gory and, 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 you know, he's an interesting guy. So they're quite scandalous as well. Okay, I'll, ch- I'll read that. I'll, I'll, yeah. We won't talk about it now because people, people <laughs> have probably had enough. Uh, thank you very much. Good to speak to you. That's, thank you so uh, much. Historian Jacob F. Field and his book, uh, One Bloody Thing After Another. We'll be finding out as well soon how we do locally as well, how uh, Coventry and Warwickshire, how gruesome we are here.